Hey, I'm Ron Giroto from KeyboardImprov.com and welcome to our journey through the real book number 206, which is the great Las Vegas Tango by Gil Evans. We're going through one tune a week. It's an eight-year project for me to keep me inspired, hopefully you as well. And I don't know, oh, the jazz police are coming to get me. I don't know if you can hear that. A, um, uh, a, a siren outside, but uh, you know, you play the wrong voicing, the jazz police. No, just kidding. Play your own voicings. So, um, Gil Evans, uh, here's a transcription, book of transcriptions, the Gil Evans collection. Um, Las Vegas Tango is in here, as is uh, my ship and a lot of wonderful things. Uh, Las Vegas Tango, the transcription here is a little incomplete. I mean, it has the voicings, which is really what we're looking for. But um, on the other hand, it's, uh, if you listen to the recording, they sort of like, you know, sometimes the trombones are playing alone and or the sax is in it. It sort of come, ebbs and flows. The instruments come in and out. Um, and I'm not sure if it was all planned or if it was uh, sort of created on the spot. Okay, you guys play here, you play here, and now we play the full voicing. And then at the, uh, the trumpets go an octave higher near the end, which is not in here. Um, but it's invaluable, um, nevertheless. So a tune like Las Vegas Tango is very, uh, it's, it, it, there's not much on the page. It's just two chords, E minor 7, A minor 7. Gil Evans described this as uh, a minor blues, but it never goes to the 5 chord. It does have the pattern of a 12-bar blues, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, but the, uh, it goes from the 1 for 4 bars, and it goes to the 4 chord back to the one. Then instead of going to the five, it goes back to the four chord in the one. And I never understood why it's called a minor blues until very recently, well, why Evans called it a minor blues until recently, when I realized that when you go to that A7 for the second time in measures um, nine and 10, where the five chord would normally be, um, you can have that attitude. You can sort of treat the 12 bar form with your phrasing as if it was the five chord sort of in that, okay, we're going to the second to last chord and then we're going home for the last time. I don't know if that makes sense. I, I just discovered that. I've never thought of it before. It was just kind of a tune that alternated between the one and the four chords. But in terms of the 12 bar form and our phrase structure, we can kind of treat it like a minor blues. And, and that seems to be what they did on the recording. It's got straight eighth notes. There's a nice groove in here. There's some nice voicings. Uh, one of the hallmarks of Gil Evans' style is that he did get into sound, the world of sound. Um, not just a particular voicing, but how, how the colors really blended together between, say, the saxes and the trumpets, or this or that. And uh, sometimes he would go for overtones as well. Miles Davis speaks about being impressed with an overtone, a note that wasn't written, but because two parts were rubbing together in a certain way, And here's some notes that are sort of ringing that not quite, it's not quite B flat. What, what he's doing here, uh, well, Miles Davis heard it in a tune called Robin's Nest, which Evans recorded, uh, arranged and recorded with the um, uh, Claude Thornhill Big Band. That's when Miles first became best friends with him, actually, their whole lives. And if you don't know the recordings they did together, check them out. This is on the individualization, individualism of Gil Evans. Wonderful recording. Um, Wayne Shorter's on. I think another tune on the recording. Um, uh, Time of the Barracudas, maybe. The Barbara song. Yeah, Wayne plays on that one. Another Miles Davis connection. Wayne Shorter, Gil Evans, Miles Davis. Uh, but what he's doing here is he's, um, he's, he's putting together like just an E minor chord. And then he throws in the F sharp for a little rub. And then at a certain point, he puts in a B flat and an E flat. Let's see if I can get it all. And it, it just really up high, and it, 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 it just it, it, it gives a sense that we're dealing with some sort of sound we can enter into, even more than, okay, this is a cool voicing, this is a cool voicing, you know? Um, and uh, so there's a modal palette. He's using voicings derived by the scale mode. And okay, if he wants a second here or a third here, that even takes um, precedence over is it a ninth or an eleventh or something. It's, it's where do I want these rubs and where do I want uh, more spread out voicings? 
And you can really experiment with that. It's really wonderful to get into that world. And uh, particularly a tune like this, it's just... That's all the melody is really. That's the whole thing right there. Um, uh, it's played in a way, if you listen to the recording, that it kind of floats over the beat. The notation here is in the real book is different than it is in the book of transcriptions, the Gil Evans collection. Uh, where does it fall on the beat? Where, where was it written? Who knows how he wrote it because it's just kind of not right on the beat. It's really wonderful how it floats. So um, when we um, uh, enter into a sound world like this or a world of feeling, of emotion, um, uh, it, it's uh, really important to, to get to know the tune really well to immerse yourself, in my case, because I love Gil Evans, immerse myself over the years in listening to recordings, the sound, the feeling of his music, and looking at some of the voicings in the transcription book, and then kind of forgetting, letting them go. And that's the language I might use, just like we use our own language, but I'm using it in a way that's right now, fresh in the moment. I don't know what's going to happen, especially on a tune like this. I'm just going to start with, um, let's see, I'll probably do like an E minor chord with an F sharp in it somehow, and, and, and just sort of see, see where this takes me. Um, wonderful opportunity here. Um, as long as I don't try to recreate the recording, if I, I found from experience, if I try to recreate what Gil Evans did, it, it's always gonna fall flat. I'm trying to make, trying to do the same thing or a similar approach that he did. But right now, right here with me and this piano and you watching. That, that's my goal right now, and, and seeing, uh, seeing where the spark is, where, where's the interest, where's, the ta where's, the, uh, where's it going to lead me, how can I enter into this right now? So E minor, um, uh, some sort of E minor modal voicing to start. And I'll probably play the melody, let's see, I'll do it out of tempo at first. But let's see, I don't know when it's going to go into tempo.
Um, don't even know what to say about that. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful experience to just totally let go and get into a very simple chord progression and, and get into that world of sound and see where it takes us. Um, Gil Evans, uh, Miles Davis' best friend, right until the end, and um, a wonderful, wonderful musician. Listen to the recordings they did together, listen to Gil's uh, recordings all the way back from the Claude Thornhill band to his solo recordings, the work with Miles, and then the stuff he did until the 80s. Um, I was lucky enough uh, to be Jerry Mulligan, the sax player's um, assistant in 87, 1987 and 88, when, uh, and they were, they were colleagues as well. And um, that was when Gil unfortunately passed away. But I got to go to the, um, the memorial service at St. Peter's Church at City Corp Center in, in New York with Jerry, and um, where Jerry recreated the arrangements Gil did for the birth of the cool, Boplicity and Moon Dreams. Check those out. They're among the best recordings ever in jazz. And I've even heard this one uh, uh, you know, somewhere on the internet. I was looking up some stuff, researching it. Someone called it the best jazz recording ever. If you don't know it, check it out and have fun with your modal explorations, getting into the world of sound. And then um, hope to see you uh, in the next video where we do something completely different, John Coltrane's classic Lazy Bird. Hope to see you then and good luck with your music.